actually going to start right at the very beginning um, with the title of the book. This is Rock and Roll's uh, Lost Revolution. That's because uh, surf music in Southern California in the early 60s was a genuine electronic revolution. What happened was you see a period in which the amplifier becomes the voice of the electric guitar, and that's when the electric guitar becomes the voice of rock and roll and leads to all subsequent uh, electric guitar styles, most notable, notably fusion, heavy metal, and punk. Now, when exactly did do you say that this started, Ken? I'll take the story back to 1957. Uh, for years, people kind of looked at surf music as a sort of musical aberration that occurred just south of Los Angeles, when in fact it was very much part of the, the creation of the whole Los Angeles rock scene in the 1960s. We begin the story with um, the founding of Delphi Records. Delphi Records was founded by the producer Bob Keane, and Bob went on to sign Richie Valens. Richie's success prompted Bob to sign Dick Dale. Uh, while Bob and Dick later split, it was at that point that Dick went down to Balboa and formed the, Gel the Deltones with uh, Nick O'Malley, and that's pretty much the, the epicenter of service. I want to go back to something you actually said there about punk and rock and roll, and you mentioned that in the book, that this is really where all of that began, and, and surf music really was an early version of punk music. Very much. It was, it was kids entertaining their friends, and I refer to it as a musical democracy, uh, a music for kids, of kids, and by kids. Uh, they were making this music with as little interference as possible, the whole point of surf music was that the surf bands were helping Fender Instruments located in nearby Fullerton research and design bigger, more powerful, and more affordable amplifiers. So that allowed young bands like the Surferis, like the Deltones, like the Tornadoes, to literally get up on stage and entertain their friends uh, with an absolute minimum of, of infrastructure, if you will. Uh, basically, uh, the Surferis, for example, they had an average age of less than 16 when they recorded Wipeout. They were able to take five guys, throw up one amplifier, one drum kit on stage, and entertain their friends with surf music all night. It's so cool when you look at it like that. And that showman amp, I don't know how many people would know that that was the cool, one of the coolest sections in the book, but it is. I love how you describe the equipment and, and how integral it is to this music. That showman amp, I'm guessing then, would be equivalent, or, um, equivalent to what the Marshall stacks are to the heavy metal guys. In fact, the showman amplifier was the very first what we call modular amplifier system. And uh, interesting story about that. Again, it was called the showman after Dick Dale. Uh, both the cabinet design and the speaker design were both part of a, a, of a collaboration between Dick Dale, Fred Tavares, and the great Leo Fender. Uh, the first one, they actually built it into a single enclosure, and it was what they called a roadie's nightmare. It weighed 120 pounds. So Leo Fender devised the idea of taking the electronics, separating them from the speaker cabinet, connecting them with a cable. Jim Marshall over in England, and as you know, in those days, it was very difficult to get American technology, American instruments in England. Uh, Jim Marshall wanted a product that would compete with the Fender Showman because at the time they were selling a lot of Showman. So he came up with his own design, although he used different speakers. He used Celestians rather than JBL. And, uh, but he, he liked that modular design. What happened was Pete Townsend, who was one of the great unsung heroes of the British blues scene, walked into Marshall's store and he said, I want it all with all eight speakers in a single enclosure. And Jim Marshall warned him, he said, your roadies won't like it. And Pete said, I don't care, I pay them. And it, after about two weeks, Pete came back and said, my roadies are all leaving me, put it in two enclosures. But that's really, that's really where the revolution started, the, the big amp, the power. Uh, when you drive a guitar amp, it gives you this whole new palette of tones and nuances. It, it's really a wonderful thing, especially if you like to play loud. And as a music that was created primarily by teenage boys to impress teenage girls, uh, they were into the power. How about the reverb tank that you talked about? That came about, interestingly enough, uh, nowadays we recall, we, we recall the reverb as the sound of surf music. The reason for that was the original reverb tanks, in performance they would heat up and it was a it was a spring suspended in a tank of oil, hence the name. As it would heat up, it would create a lot of collateral sounds, 
fizzes, pops, drizzles, sounds that surfers recognize from being inside the wave. Most importantly, when you shot or bumped or dropped the reverb unit, it actually made the sound of cresting and breaking wave. Uh, so that that's where people made that connection to surf. Uh, the name comes from two places. It was the surfers who were embracing this music, and B, it was from the Fender Reverb unit. But it actually began when Dick Dale wanted something for his voice. Uh, and it was originally developed to help Dick sing because the PA systems at the time were very primitive. And it really didn't pick up, again, the nuances in his voice. When he plugged his guitar into it, he found out it did wonderful things for him. That's how the reverb became the sound of surf. Dick Dale, um, I, I don't know how you want to describe him. I'm going to ask you because I would say that he's probably the most recognizable figure in that genre of music and the most well-respected. But I'm going to let you tell me, who's Dick Dale? Dick Dale is one of the most important and yet one of the most underestimated artists in the history of modern guitar. Uh, because Dick Dale, along with Leo Fender, along with Fred Tavares, he was the first artist to really get together with, with the technology designers and say, let's build a new instrument. And when they did build a new instrument, there were always unintended consequences, like with the reverb, and then they would explore those. Uh, Dick is basically the godfather of heavy metal and pretty much all modern guitar styles because he didn't stop at the guitar. He recognized, like Leo Fender did, that in an electric guitar, the electric guitar is only half of the equation. The other half is the amplifier because that's the voice. And that's how, as I said, the amplifier became the voice of the guitar. That's when the guitar became the voice of rock and roll. Well, another originator and creative force in music who I don't think many people would expect to show up in this book was Frank Zappa. And what? And he's really a huge part of this. So tell us about Frank Zappa and Cucamonga. That surprises everybody. Frank Zappa graduated from Antelope Valley High School in the late 50s, and he came out here to the Ontario Ranch Cucamonga area to attend courses at Chapin College, and he also audited music courses out of Claremont College, which is the finest complex in the nation. And he ran into a gentleman by the name of Paul Buff. Paul had a small studio called Powell Recording Studio, and Paul had never been inside a recording studio in his life, but he was, a, he was an electronic genius. So he followed his ears to find a way to make great sound, and he devised his own five-track recording machine at a time in which the industry standard was two tracks, gradually moving to three tracks. So Paul brought Frank in, and this is where Frank had started playing this wonderful new instrument called the multi-track recording machine. And uh, because it was a very, it was a very centrally located studio because we're right side of right outside of Los Angeles, but very close to a lot of very great music scenes in San Bernardino Valley and the Pomona Valley, Riverside. Um, they got a lot of business and it really provide, provided an entry to a lot of the bands that were out here that didn't have the money or the resources to go to LA to record it at a studio like Gold Star Recording Studios, which even then was a very affordable experience. Um, but because of that, Frank ended up recording and engineering an awful lot of the surf bands that were coming out of here because, again, it was the most affordable entry-level music a kid could get into. And in fact, my, re my research indicates that the rhythm guitar player on the Safari's Wipeout may be playing through Frank Zappa's amp on that historic record. And you mentioned that Jan and Dean is a turning point in the book. How, how so? They were actually the first truly vocal band. But their big influence on Brian Wilson was to take Brian into the studio and introduce him to the key players who would later play on almost all the Beach Boy albums. And these are people like uh, Earl Palmer, the great Hal Blaine, the great Carol Kay, uh, the people we call the Wrecking Crew today. And Brian is introduced to most of these people and the interesting configurations that they would use. For instance, all the Jan Dean records used two drummers, Earl Palmer and Hal Blaine. Brian very often used two bass players, uh, Lyle Ritz and Carol Kay, one playing acoustic, one playing electric. So it introduced him to a lot of new methods and a lot of new opportunities afforded by the studios. Now the third wave, no pun intended, of surf music is Pulp Fiction. That is correct. Uh, the story always went that uh, Quentin Tarantino envisioned the plot of Pulp Fiction listening to a, a tape of surf music instrumentals. 
Uh, it's not true, but it's such a good story I had to repeat it. Uh, but essentially, the early surf guitar players and the pre-surf players, which is Dwayne Eddy, the Ventures, the Fireballs, uh, Johnny and the Hurricanes, who had a huge influence on people like Eddie Bertrand and Paul Johnson. Um, they also had a, had a huge influence on a lot of players who were in the session world. And the session world in the early 60s spent more time making movies. And they were the ones that influenced what we call spaghetti westerns, uh, Vic Flick and the James Bond team. Um, and this is basically, like I said, this is where you see this great blossoming of exploring these new tones in the guitars and the amps, and even the designs. A lot of people feel that had it not been for that bolt-on neck design of Leo Fender's, there never would have been that kind of music because you really need that type of tension on a neck to create those, those deep, dark, scary sounds. How about today? Where do you see surf music, and where do you see its influence in bands that are popular today? Well, I didn't get a chance to mention it in the book, but there's a gentleman, a guitarist by the name of Gary Hoy, who did the... Um, who did the soundtrack for Bruce Brown's Endless Summer 2. If you listen to Gary Hoy, that's probably the cleanest example of surf music as it evolved into modern guitar. Uh, as a classical statement of an indigenous folk music, uh, the second wave bands, most notably John and the Knight Riders, and um, people like the Surf Raiders, you see them embracing the original technology, the original approaches, uh, and yet making new music with all these approaches. And that has that is most notably in the Surfer Joe Festival last week in Italy. So the whole it's all around. It it has pervaded every aspect of music. Uh, we see it in its purest forms with guitar players like John Blair. Uh, we see it as it evolved in, in artists like Gary Hoy, Larry Carlton, who started out with the Challengers. Um, and we we see the whole thing today as this giant scene, traditionalists, people who are using this music as sort of a neoclassical form. It's still very much alive. And the beauty of it is most of the instruments that were created by this revolution are still around. I was so fortunate growing up to have been in the thick of all these different phases of the music. I grew up in Newport Beach uh, at the time Dick Dale was playing down at the rendezvous. I was in Laguna Beach at the time of Five Summer Stories and, and Honk, which is sort of the phantom wave that connects the first and the last wave. And I was actually performing at the Cuckoo's Nest and on Sunset Strip Rock Club when I first encountered John and the Night Riders, when I actually watched Punk's Metalhead's New Wave Days, as we used to call them, Skinny Pie Band. And the one music that they all seemed to find common cause with was uh, the rediscovery of this wonderful surf music by John Fletch. <laughs> 